You're listening to Storytime in Paris on Paris Underground Radio. For more great content, please join us on Patreon. Since well before Victor Hugo first looked at Notre Dame and thought, huh, what if a hunchback lived in there? Writers have been inspired by Paris. Welcome to the Storytime in Paris podcast on Paris Underground Radio. I'm your host, Jennifer Garrity, an award-winning filmmaker, self-professed book nerd, and creator of the Paris Underground Radio podcast network. This podcast is for anyone who loves books, loves authors, loves France, or any combination therein. Each week, I'll speak with an author whose life, stories, or characters have a connection to France. Then, these amoureux de livre will treat us to a reading from their book. My guest this week is award-winning author Donald Lystra. Donald's first two books, Season of Winter and Ice and Something That Feels Like Truth, both won the Midwest Book Award and the Michigan Notable Book Award by the Library of Michigan. He has also received fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts and the McDowell Colony, where he won the General Friand Award for Emerging Writers. Donald's latest novel, Searching for Van Gogh, is a coming-of-age story told from the perspective of Nate, against the backdrop of 1963 Michigan. Nate has lived a relatively sheltered life, but recent events have thrust him from his bubble, and he's learning that there's more to the world than what he'd been brought up around. You know that feeling when you first wake up in a bright room and you have to sort of blink to get your eyes to adjust? The book unfolds a bit like that. So, please allow me to introduce Donald Lystra, author of Searching for Van Gogh. Hello, Donald. Thank you so much for joining me today. I'm very happy to be here, Jennifer. I'm so excited to talk to you. Before we dive in, can you tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do? Sure. I'm retired now, actually. And I, as far as my writing goes, I really didn't begin that until kind of late in life. So it was a uh, thing that I did when I had more time to do it, I guess, after our kids grew up and left. I had time to do something I always wanted to do, which was to try my hand at writing fiction. But I live in Michigan, uh, and I've uh, lived there almost all my life in different places. And uh, I went to college at the University of Michigan, and I studied engineering, and that was my career during my working life. But like I said, I always liked literature, and, and I had an idea that I wanted to try to do it someday. In the early 90s, I had a operation which had a fairly long period of recovery, and I decided that that would be a good time for me to try to indulge what I always wanted to do. And uh, so I started writing and I wrote some more and I went back to work and I kept writing <laughs> and uh, decided I wanted to do it more seriously, uh, actually to the point of actually changing my career a little bit uh, to make time for it. But I really enjoyed it and I enjoyed the sense of discovery you have when you write fiction, kind of blending facts and imagination. And here I am, uh, what, 25 years later, 30 years later, still doing it. So. I guess in a thumbnail, that's who I am. That's amazing. It's nice to have such a good silver lining for a period of convalescence. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it turned out to be a blessing, I guess, the operation that I had. And this is your third novel, is that right? Uh, it's my third work of fiction. My second novel, my first book was a novel called Season of Water and Ice. And then a couple of years after that, I published a short story collection called Something That Feels Like Truth. And then uh, just now, about a month ago, in fact, my recent novel came out, Searching for Van Gogh. Yeah, so I have three books to my credit, you might say. It's amazing. I'm always interested when people start writing later on in life. Had you always had an idea like itching inside you? Did you know what kind of thread you wanted to pick at? <laughs> well, I did really... Uh... And I don't know where it came from exactly. Uh, most writers say that they, they loved reading when they were young and they couldn't read enough books and they spent a good deal of time in libraries. And I wasn't like that. I had difficulty learning to read. I think it was kind of what they call dyslexia now. But I uh, struggled with reading and I went to a remedial reading 
teacher, actually, that was in our school during my grade school years. And I probably didn't start reading to the point where I could actually get my way through a book until I was 12 or 13 years old. And I, I, I don't know, I, this may be my imagination, but I, I always felt that that introduction to reading might have uh, given me a appreciation of, of literature. I, I learned in the process of learning how to read to go word by word through written matter. And I think that gave me a sense for the way words work together and um, maybe kind of the rhythm of words when you put them down on a page. But for, anyway, for whatever reason, yes, I've always uh, wanted to write. And, and like I said, I fortunately had a time in my life, quite a bit later in my life, when I was able to do it. I love that. So let's talk about your connection to Paris or to France. Do you have one? Uh, well, I do, yes. In terms of my feelings about France and about Paris, my wife and I have traveled in France quite a bit, and we've been in Paris two or three times for fairly extended periods of a month or so. And uh, I, I, I don't know, I just like uh, the culture of France. I like the French people. I think that they sort of created a civilization that balances the different parts of a person's life, you know, between private and public and working and leisure and family and an individual. So yes, I've always loved uh, France and Paris. I've spent a fairly good amount of time there. And then in other parts of France too, in the south of France, we've spent time uh, renting a place for two or maybe three times. We were there for a month renting uh, a place in small towns in Provence. As far as my book goes and its connection to Paris, my main character, the narrator of the story, is a young man who uh, is going through some troubles, you might say, uh, trying to come to grips with a couple of tragedies that have happened in his life. And he gets kind of enchanted by the Impressionist painters, you know, that flourished in Paris about 100 years ago. And he uh, does some reading, and in particular, he, he reads the uh, letters that Vincent van Gogh wrote to his brother, uh, where he spoke about his painting and how he was sort of led by his emotions, you know, to create the paintings. My character gets enchanted by this and decides that he wants to explore life through art. And so even though he's kind of oriented towards math and science, he takes up painting and he really doesn't have a background to do it, but he's serious about wanting to do it and wanting to try to discover you know, truths and, and meanings in life, you know, through the act of painting. So uh, I guess in a nutshell, that's my connection to Paris and, and my book's connection to Paris. Perfect. Well, that's a perfect segue into my questions for you. So Searching for Van Gogh, it's set in Michigan in the fall of 1963. This is a very character-driven book, but it seems to me that it's as much about mood as it is about plot. And so I'm curious why you wanted to set this lovely, slower paced unfolding of a book in a time and place that's marked by so much political unrest and turmoil. Well, that's a very interesting question, Jennifer. Uh, I guess I uh, I like to write about places that I know, and, and I know Grand Rapids very well, Grand Rapids, Michigan. I spent the first 12 years of my life there. and had relatives there, so I went back quite frequently later in life. I think the idea of placing the story there, I've always felt that the Midwest and parts of the Midwest that are considered kind of backwater areas, you know, by the coastal people, you know, they think the Midwest is sort of a place without, where, where nothing much happens of interest. But I, I guess in my writing, I try to uh, refute that because I think quite a few important things happen. And Maybe they happen on a quieter scale. You know, there's not so much drama involved, maybe, in some of the things that people do. But they do struggle in different ways with life. And they come to uh, insights about life in ways that are quite dramatic and interesting. And I, I guess I chose the time period, 1963, because it was a very interesting time in, uh, in history. And I've tried to bring some of that into the book. This isn't exactly an historical novel by any means, but I did try to bring in, you know, the culture and the politics and the 
you know, the features of, of the uh, 1960s. I guess I did that for the same reason. It was a period that I knew about very well. Uh, I understood uh, the things that I was writing about. The characters that I put into the book are not characters that I ever exactly knew firsthand, but the situations that I had them in, the places I had them in, uh, I knew quite a bit about those very well. I guess that is the reason uh, I chose Grand Rapids and, and why I chose 1963. You definitely do incorporate what's happening in the wider world into what's happening in this book, but it sort of unfolds like these little ripples and waves and there are pockets of time when it doesn't really matter what year we're in and then there are pockets of time when it very much does. Yeah, well, I'm very happy to hear that. That was the effect that I was trying to create. Like I said, I didn't want to write an historical novel, but I wanted the history of the time to sort of work its way into uh, the story. And so I'm very happy to hear that that's the way you read it, too. Yeah, I did. No, it doesn't seem like this book could exist outside of the time period that it does, at least. Good. So our main character is Nate. And in many ways, this is his coming of age story. He's 17 years old when we begin. And he seems to me to have grown up in a relatively sheltered fashion. He's mostly influenced by his community, by his nuclear family. Uh, and then some things happen in his life that sort of shake his foundation. He decides to force sort of a hard right in his life to try something new and to try to find his footing in this larger world. But he strikes me as as quite naive in comparison to the people around him. Were there particular challenges in writing a naive main character? Well, there there were, you know, getting the voice right, trying to uh, show uh, his naivete without making him look, you know, sort of backwards or ignorant. I, I, I do think he was naive, but I don't think he was probably as naive as someone familiar with America uh, in 2024, would think you know. I think a lot of a lot of America was naive back in 1963, and my my narrator might have been a little bit more naive. And he has a sheltered life. I don't go into this very much, but his father is a uh, salesman who has been moved from one sales territory to another while Nate was growing up. So he never really was in a place long enough to feel like he belonged there. And so he's grown up kind of feeling like an outsider to things. And he has he has that perspective, you know, as an outsider looking into something rather than as a participant. Well, that's what I guess there's one more thing I would say about that. In a very minor key way, the Kennedy assassination plays out in the background, maybe the last third of the book. And, you know, it's funny, I was a teenager when that happened. And Whenever I've talked about it with other people my age, they really consider that kind of as a momentous turning point culturally and for them personally. The post-war years in America were, you know, they were prosperous and uh, America was kind of leading the world. And the Kennedy assassination kind of threw everybody back on their heels and, and made people realize, I think, how tenuous life is, you know, how things can change in a moment and how they can change in a very ugly way. And uh, as I say, a lot of people my age sort of think of that event, the Kennedy assassination, as the launching of all the turmoil, the cultural turmoil that came later in the 60s. It was sort of an eye-opening experience, and it opened people up to a lot of other things that were wrong in the world, maybe. I guess I wanted my character to go through this too, you know, to go through a kind of awakening caused by the politics of the time. And sort of in the beginning, I may have painted him as too naive. And, you know, I wanted someone who comes to the realization of the hard knocks that life can deliver suddenly and, uh, you know, move forward with that knowledge. If you're enjoying this podcast, you may also enjoy my podcast, City of Muses. Each week, I chat with contemporary artists and creatives to explore what inspires them, where their creativity comes from, and how Paris has helped or hindered their dreams come true. Check out City of Muses now, available wherever you listen to podcasts. We'll be right back with Storytime in Paris after a word from our sponsors. 
And now, back to story time in Paris. And a lot of these revelations also come through Audrey, another character in your book. And it seems to me that Nate's world is a pretty patriarchal world, which is not surprising as it's set in the U.S. in the 1960s, and we could argue it's still the same today. <laughs> um, <laughs> but the men around him seem to be these manly men in traditionally masculine fields, like the army or the factory or engineering. These are men that don't shy away from violence either. But our guide, our muse through the story is Audrey, who is a woman. Why were her eyes the lens that you wanted Nate to view the world through? Well, that's a very interesting question, and I'm not sure I have a completely uh, thought-out answer to it. I did want to bring in, you know, the culture as far as uh, men's roles and women's roles back in that time period. But there were people, young people mostly, who uh, even in 1963 were rebelling against that kind of a culture. And I wanted the main female of the story, Audrey, to be of that kind, you know, a, a bright, you know, energetic, ambitious person who is going against the grain of life. And she is naive, too, in, in a lot of ways, too, although she, she has what you could call street smarts, her knowledge of how, how bad a, a place the world can be sometimes. You know, she comes through some realizations, too, in the course of the story. But anyway, I, I guess I wanted to bring two people together who I thought were interesting for different reasons and just see what happened. You know, that's the way I do my writing. Usually I start with a situation and characters, and I really don't know where it's going to go, but I bring them together. Sometimes I'll have an opening scene in mind, which I did for this book, in fact. And then I just sort of push them forward and see what happens step by step. And usually, if I do that in the right way, you know, a point will come where, or several points maybe will come where they have insights and come to understandings about themselves and about the world. And those are kind of the dramatic turning points uh, that make a story interesting or hopefully make it interesting. And so that's what I was doing with my two characters, too. I loved these characters. I have such just compassion and affection for them. I really enjoyed spending time with them. I enjoyed them learning from and growing from one another. They both are going through their own personal events, but also really sponges for what's happening around them. And they're so interested in each other in that way. I really appreciated that. And in terms of Audrey, you know, she's, there are a lot of questions about her in the book. There's, she's a bit of a mystery. You know, we don't really know who she is, what exactly she does, where she comes from, why she left. And a lot of these questions get answered in the book, but not all of them. And like you said, she does seem to understand the darker side of life much better than Nate does. But in many ways, she remains a mystery to Nate throughout. Oftentimes, her purpose just seems to be to show him that there's more to the world than he thought that there was. How much of her story did you know when you started writing? Not very much more than the opening scene, really. And she is mysterious in certain ways, and deliberately so in some ways with respect to, to Nate. You know, she doesn't want to completely reveal who she is and what she's doing. And so Nate certainly... Uh, has a difficult time coming to an understanding of her. But, well, I, I guess I did want her to have some depth, you know, and I, and I guess I even wanted the story to end uh, with her not being completely understood, still having some uh, part of her life that is not completely clear even to the reader who's followed her through, you know, a couple of hundred pages. In some ways, her character was the launching point of the book. You know, I had in mind a young woman who is experiencing hard times, and she sort of found herself or created for herself a rather odd and in some ways a dangerous way to uh, make a livelihood. And I just wanted to follow her, and then I wanted to follow the character Nate that I put her in contact with 
and just see how that chemistry plays out. That's exactly how I read it too. I was like, okay, so what happens now? What happens <laughs> now? And okay, we're going to follow this thread. Where does that go? And now we're going to go over here. And where does that go? And I hope they see each other again. <laughs> well, good. The book does uh, touch on a lot of different things. You know, it covers a lot of ground, you might say. But I, I did want there to be a main thread through it. And I guess that main thread is the uh, relationship that forms between these two people. You know, that's the throughput that, uh, you know, hopefully carries a reader through from the beginning to the end. Definitely. And I love that Nate's biggest cultural influences seem to be the Impressionists, specifically Van Gogh. <laughs> and Audrey's biggest cultural references seems to be Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People. <laughs> what drew you to these references? As far as Van Gogh goes, I've always, uh, of course, like, so many people, you know, I react and respond to Van Gogh's paintings. He was very much an outsider at the time, and perhaps that was one reason I wanted to sort of bring him forward as the embodiment of this uh, artistic sensibility that uh, my character Nate is trying to understand. He was very much an arts outsider in the art world of Paris and France when he was painting and, and even at his death, you know, he was virtually unknown. It was several decades, in fact, after he died, as I understand it, that he was sort of discovered. And, uh, you know, the fame that he has now sort of began in the 1920s, I think. And so I had my character, Nate, who is an outsider, sort of making a connection with a uh, Impressionist painting, uh, who was also an, an outsider. I guess that was the reason for choosing Van Gogh is kind of the focal point, you know. But anyway, that, uh, yeah, I don't know if that's a proper answer to your question, Jennifer, or not. What about Audrey? Why did you decide on Dale Carnegie for her? Oh, Dale Carnegie. Yeah, you know, I was a little bit uh, nervous about using Dale Carnegie because I'm not sure that a lot of readers today even know about Dale Carnegie. Back in the 50s and 60s and 70s and 80s, uh, and maybe even into the 90s. He wrote a very famous book back in the 30s, How to Win Friends and Influence People. And it was an enormous success. And basically, it tried to teach people how to manage their careers so that they could move forward in the world and, and progress in their careers. And Audrey, uh, for whatever reason, learns about the book that he wrote. And she is herself trying to make a place in the world to build a career she kind of latches onto that book and the lessons that it provides as being a guidepost for her to follow. So I, I wanted her to be a, a young woman with ambitions, I guess. That was the reason that I, I chose the Dale Carnegie reference. You know, anybody who was uh, interested in Dale Carnegie was someone who was serious about their career, you know, and wanting to advance in the world. And that's what I wanted Audrey to be. That makes perfect sense. Do you paint yourself? I don't, you know, I'm terrible <laughs> at anything graphic, but I have an enormous admiration for people that do it, you know, and I think over my life, I've maybe I've taught myself or uh, maybe my wife has helped me on this score, but I've come to understand painting and understand art, graphic art, a whole lot better than I did when I was a young man. But no, I don't paint and neither has Nate, you know, and I wanted that. I wanted this discovery of art to be something new in his life. And he, he goes about it in a very naive way, too, you know, as if he can, without any preparation or any training, he can just, you know, buy a canvas and some oil paints and become a painter. Uh, you know, his, his motivation is entirely sincere. You know, he understands that art and painting is a way of making discoveries about life, you know, and understanding things about life. So his motivations are completely sincere, but he's very naive about, you know, how easy it is to do it. <laughs> and that becomes actually the early link between him and Audrey. You know, she has somewhat of a background in art. The first thing she does is to tell him uh, something about his art that he was not understanding, you know, which is uh, the way colors interact with each other. So it's kind of a training situation that brings them together initially, and then that goes on from there and becomes a little more of a uh, friendship in, in other aspects. 
I think that's probably my favorite scene in the book where they meet. I mean, there are a lot of scenes that I really like, but that's the one that I go back to again and again in my mind. I really love that scene. Is that right? I'm happy to hear that. The original manuscript I had, had that, well, I didn't know where to place it. You know, you never know when you start a book, whether you want to pick something out that has a lot of drama to it and maybe bring it forward and have that be the entree point. But I, I like that scene a lot. I like the interaction. I like the way the characters reveal themselves. So I kept that up front kind of the launching point of their story. Yeah, I loved it. I loved it where it was. I don't know where it had been, but I liked it where it was. <laughs> <laughs> I think it would be really nice if we could hear a little bit from the book. Would you mind reading for us? No, I'd be happy to. Uh, and in fact, maybe I will read the opening page or two, because that way I guess I don't have to set it up <laughs> <laughs> the way I would if I went to, deeper into the book. <laughs> So this is chapter one. The narrator is Nate, the young man. Audrey Brubaker said it was completely innocent. She wanted to be perfectly clear on that point. She'd gotten the idea, she said, from that movie with Audrey Hepburn, Breakfast at Tiffany's, where a young woman in New York City hangs out with rich businessmen and gets paid for going out to dinner and being nice to them. And she believed the similarities, having the same first name, and being a country girl trying to make it in a big city was a sort of providential message. What she would do, she said, was to go in the afternoon to the lobby of one of the big hotels, the Saxony or the Cosmopolitan or the Pantland, and strike up a conversation with a man who looked like a successful businessman. After making small talk for a while, which she was good at, she would ask him if he'd like to take a walking tour of downtown Grand Rapids. Almost always the businessman would say yes, and then she would take him for a walk around the city, explaining the streets and the statues and the history of the city. When the walking tour was over, the man would give her 10 or $20, and often he would ask her to have dinner with him. And that's my livelihood, Audrey said, that and the Rexall lunch counter. What if the men, you know, get fresh? She gave me a crafty smile as if she was going to tell me something interesting that I would like to know about. They almost never do, she said. Businessmen are lonely more than anything else. They just want someone to listen to their jokes or sit with them on a park bench while they brag about their kids or pour out their tales of woe. But what if they do get fresh? There are ways to handle it, she said. A hug or a kiss on the cheek will go a long way. She looked at me with a knowing expression as if she were letting me in on a secret only a few people understood. In my opinion, sex is oversold. We were sitting in a starlight lounge after one of Audrey's clients, Mr. Smollett of the North American Ball Bearing Company, had walked out. I sat back in the booth with Smollett's drink in my hand, and I thought about what Audrey had said and whether I could believe her. I tried to picture her hugging Mr. Smollett and whether that would work whether that would be enough. I saw that movie with Audrey Hepburn, I said. I saw it last year with my girlfriend. And I remember the girl went to dinner with rich businessmen, but I don't remember her giving tours. I added that part, Audrey said. I think it's an improvement, frankly. It's like I'm doing them, the men, a little favor, like Dale Carnegie says you're supposed to do. That was another one of her peculiarities, a passion for Dale Carnegie, and how he could teach you how to win friends and influence people so you could have a better life. But I, I'm getting ahead of myself. I should probably say how I met Audrey in the first place, because that would explain a lot about what came later. Like the time we broke into Audrey's parents' house in our trip to northern Michigan to bring my brother's body home. That would be the logical place to start, which is something logic I think I'm pretty good at. Have you always dreamed of owning a place in Paris? If you're planning on moving, renting, buying, or selling a place in France, you'll need the expert guidance of Gail Boisclair and Marie Pistinier, hosts of the Paris Estate of Mind podcast. Listen now to Paris Estate of Mind on parisundergroundradio.com or wherever you listen to podcasts. We'll be right back with Storytime in Paris after a word from our sponsors. And now, back to Storytime in Paris. So that's uh, 
actually, I went further than <laughs> I said I was going to. I mean, it sets your book up beautifully, so I think it's I think it's perfect. Yeah, well, that was the scene that I actually had it in mind for years. For some reason, I liked the situation. I liked a young woman who was both, as I said before, kind of street smart, but also naive. You know, she undertakes this profession, which could be very dangerous for her, but she undertakes it with a naive feeling that uh, she can do it and, and everything would be fine. Well, fabulous. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that. What is next for you? Are you working on another book? Uh, well, I haven't started one. Well, I have. <laughs> I, I have a lot of starts that I've uh, put aside over the years. And there is one in particular, I guess, that I I may go back to. I've, I've written two books about young protagonists, uh, teenage protagonists, and in different ways, they're both coming of age stories. <laughs> And I decided I want to write my next book about a mature character who's dealing kind of with a uh, a crisis of mid-age, you know, and how you work through that. It's set in Michigan. Like I say, I try to set my stories in places that I know about. So it's set in Michigan. It's uh, principally set in Ann Arbor, Michigan, which is where I lived most of my life. And uh, as I say, it involves a middle-aged man who uh, is... uh, like any uh, character in a novel, I guess, should be. He's dealing with problems in his life. <laughs> and hopefully over the course of the book, you'll learn uh, about how to come to grips with them. Very interesting. Well, you have to keep us up to date with that book when as it comes along. <laughs> yeah. So where can people find you if they do want to keep up to date with you and what you're working on? Are you online? Well, I do have a website. It's not completely up to date with respect to my most recent book, I still have some work to do on that. It's uh, uh, donalleistra.com. And uh, the people I'm working with who helped me put the book together encouraged me to get on Facebook. (laughs) And I actually had a Facebook account, but it had been dormant for about 10 years. Uh, Because of their urging, I sort of, uh, I gave it another life. And so there's uh, they want me to post things on there periodically about what I'm doing as a writer. So I have a Facebook page and I have a, a Facebook author's page, which I didn't know there was such a thing, but indeed <laughs> there is. So people can find me there. Those are probably the best places to, to look for me. Perfect. Okay. Well, I will include links to both of those places in our show notes so people can get to you really easily. And uh, hopefully everybody will go out and buy this beautiful book that you've written. Yeah, well, thank you, uh, Jennifer. I, I'm, I'm very pleased that you liked the book and uh, uh, enjoyed uh, having a conversation with you. Me too. Thank you so much for taking the time. You bet. Thank you again to Donald Leister for such an interesting conversation. You can find Donald on Facebook at Donald Leister Author and on his website, donaldleister.com. Please join me next week when I'll be speaking with the founder of La Cuisine Paris, Jane Birch, about her memoir, The French Ingredient. Check back next week to see if your questions have been answered and to hear a reading from her book. Thank you for listening to Storytime in Paris. I'm your host, Jennifer Garrity, and you can find me on all socials at Jenny Foria. That's J-E-N-N-Y-P-H-O-R-I-A. If you like this podcast, please take a moment to rate and review it wherever you listen to podcasts. This is the fastest and easiest way to help the podcast grow, which will help me attract more great authors to bring to you. Please also spread the word to all the people you know who also love to read. Thank you again, and happy reading! This episode of Storytime in Paris was produced by Jennifer Garrity for Paris Underground Radio. For more on this show and shows like it, please visit parisundergroundradio.com.